Welcome back to another edition of Movement is a Lifestyle. I'm your host, Ben Reuter. We promote the ethos that movement is a lifestyle in the Pittsburgh area, especially the South Hills, and try to find interesting people and or knowledgeable people, sometimes both as in the case of today's guest, to talk about movement, health, wellness, uh, whether you're a young person, old person, or you probably saw in a past episode, have a four-legged friend who you may refer to as a person even though they're a dog. Today we're here with Frank Velasquez. Frank is the Director of Sports Performance for Allegheny Health Network's Sports Medicine and Performance, which is a mouthful. Uh, in a previous lifetime, he worked in Major League Baseball, and in a previous lifetime before that, he was an athletic training student at the University of Michigan. So all you Pitt fans, don't say anything. Frank, thanks for taking the time to come on Movement as a Lifestyle. Ben, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. I know one of the things that we've joked about before, since both of us are not Pittsburgh natives, is if you're from the North Hills, you don't know what's happening in the South Hills and vice versa, and God forbid you have to go through the Squirrel Hill Tunnels. So I know Allegheny Health Network is pretty much all over the city, but you have two, soon to be three, sports performance centers. Just talk a little bit about A, where those centers are, and B, what exactly they do for maybe listeners or viewers who don't know what it is. Yeah, thanks, Ben. We're very blessed uh, to be with AHN and to, to have the platform and support from the Orthopedic Institute to create this blended product to create specialty facilities that I oversee. It's uh, sports performance and physical therapy. Our first was in Cool Springs down in the South Hills. And then we, we built another one in Wexford. That's at the Wexford Plaza. So we have North and South covered. The third one will be in Montour, which will be opening uh, late October. And then we're in talks for our fourth up in the Erie region. One of our hospitals, St. Vincent Hospitals, is in Erie. So we'll be working on that for 2023. Uh, these specialty locations, target market for active adults, developing youth, and athletes of all levels, from our kids just getting started to our Olympians, professional elite, um, where we provide physical therapy and sports rehabilitation, strength training, speed agility, power development, and then recovery services. And I know one of the things that I like about having sports performance associated with a hospital or a medical facility, I know you and I have talked in the past, sometimes if you're a parent or you're somebody who's an athlete yourself, you don't know exactly where to go for injuries if you get injured because you know there are orthopedic surgeons and then there are orthopedic surgeons and other types of physicians, physical medicine physicians, who understand the importance of movement and those who don't. And then even more importantly, for the rehab setting, we all know that physical therapy, athletic training is developing, um, but there's still some old school people who believe put an ice bag on it, a little ultrasound and exercise is not a good thing. And that's not what your center does. It does not only rehabilitation for people who want to be active, but maybe people who don't, or excuse me, people who do want to be active, but maybe they don't know exactly how to get started. If you could talk a little bit about that, because a lot of people, because of COVID has said, hey, you know, I wanna be more active. I recognize being healthy is gonna help me fight off diseases and improve my quality of life. Sure, so um, the model is, is just that. It, it, you don't need to be injured to come to us. You don't need to be an athlete to come to us. In our eyes, everyone's a performer. Um, you'll come in, we'll do a kinetic chain assessment, find out where your restrictions are, where you're tight, loose, weak, strong, and we customize the program for you and we take a lot of pride in building programs that are age appropriate. So as we start our youngsters, they're not gonna be under a barbell with you know, lots of weight on them or on the other end of the spectrum. If we have a, you know, an elderly person that wants to continue to golf or carry their grandbabies without pain, we build programs as appropriately for the age as well as the person based off the assessment that we do. And I think one of the things I've joked about with friends and colleagues of mine who are orthopedic surgeons or physical medicine physicians is whenever marathon training starts, whether it's in December or January for the spring marathon or coming up right now or maybe a few weeks prior for fall marathon seasons, I've asked them before, I said, you know, can you tell that this is happening? And most of them say, oh, yeah, there's an increase of injuries. So a facility like uh, Allegheny Health Network Sports Medicine and Performance, this is where people can go before. It's like they get talked into joining a, a, a team in training or a marathon group and they've never run before. Personally, I think it's a good idea for them to seek out, maybe it's not AHN, but somebody else who mm -hmm. can look at them who's qualified to say, hey, these are some weak areas, these are some things, you know, maybe you're not set to do the marathon at this point in time, or maybe you are, but you should do these additional things that maybe your friends aren't doing, with the goal being, 
you finish the marathon, you have a good time, and you move on with your life without saying, yeah, I ran a marathon once, and ever since then I can't walk. Sure, we'd love to see people on the front end all the time, but sometimes we do see them on the back end where they end up getting injured and getting into one of our AHN primary care sports positions to PT, and then they find us. But once in a while, they do listen to their friends or they do some research and realize, you know, I might include some strength training in my marathon plan, marathon program, where we can help you develop that program. Whether you come in, like you said, our facility, the YMCA, LA Fitness, or even your own home, you don't need a half a million dollar facility to really keep your joints protected and, and your skeleton in a good neutral position. We can do some things at home. And I know you've had a long career working with athletes, working with baseball athletes, working with football athletes. We're filming this uh, towards the end of August where <clears throat> high school sports are slowly ramping up. Mm -hmm. Some of them are ramping up faster than others. Are there recommendations that you might have for parents? I know your son plays football and he's a track and field athlete. And I think sometimes that's probably good because dad has extra knowledge and sometimes that's probably <laughs> bad because it's like, well, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about, dad. What are some recommendations or some things you can give maybe for parents whose kids are first getting into sports, they're first playing their fall sport, whether it's soccer, field hockey, football, or even cheerleading? Sure, so that's a great question. So one is you wanna have a physical. And I know if they're involved in school sports, we do a great job across the board, no matter the high school you go to. I think it's a state law. You have to have a physical before you participate. That's number one. Um, two is if you're just starting off in the sport, which by the time they're to high school nowadays, they have years of repetition and years of experience. You want to uh, make sure you're doing the things you need to do for that sport. That doesn't mean X's and O's. That means, you know, what can I do better from a nutritional standpoint, rest and recovery and hydration? What can I do better from a flexibility program or a strength training program? To number one, reduce the risk for injury because our goal, and I was the same way when I was in professional sports, is to keep our product, meaning the athlete, on the field. So we want our programs to reduce the risk for injury. And then number two is, you know, maybe I can enhance, put myself in a better position to enhance my performance if I can run faster or jump higher or hit the ball further. And that's where your strength training comes in. So by the time they get to high school, they should be in a strength training program, whether it be with the school program or another program like ours with AHN. What about if they're younger, if they're six, seven, eight, and mom and dad say, hey, you know, time to start playing youth football or there's youth soccer or whatever it is. What should the parents know? Because some parents are going to be like you who've been active all their life and in the profession, and other parents may not have been athletes. They may have gone in other directions, but their son or daughter wants to be an athlete. Sure, the younger generation is, is um, definitely, uh, <clears throat> it's different being an eight to 10 year old now than what it was when we were eight, eight to 10 years old. Um, my best advice to them is to, to be playing, get outside, play, be less sedentary on the couch with video games or God forbid you're already texting on phones. Um, and as a parent of that eight to 10 year old is, is uh, be present, you know, be present, go to the practices and watch, don't coach. Watch as a parent, let the coaches coach and watch what's going on. Um, again, they don't need to come to us for strength training. They just need to go out and play. And really to, to teach our young athletes the difference between soreness and injury. Um, some, of us, some of them have never experienced soreness and all of a sudden it's, oh, my shoulder, you know, and really in a day or two it's gone because it's muscular soreness. Maybe they had a compression, you know, a con compression, uh, contusion injury. Uh, where we throw a little ice on it, maybe a little bit of rest. Rest is good. Rest is a lost art. It seems like we are in the, the, a, the day and age of more is better, and we need to shove 10 days of activities into seven days. And our young bodies just aren't ready to handle it. So it rears its ugly head in the form of stress reactions, stress fractures, burnout, fatigue. Um, and that's definitely, as a parent, you want to make sure you are watching out for those symptoms, irritability, inability to sleep, um, constant fatigue, lack of focus. No one knows your children better than the parents do. And those are the things we, we look for with our young athletes to make sure that they are playing for fun and they're playing to enhance their ability. And, but we need to keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't become a job for them. And I know as a parent who has an athlete, how do you attack uh, late night screen time with your kids? Because we know there's a lot of time on the screen 
blue screen, they're not going to sure. sleep well, it's going to affect the recovery, their ability to practice the next day. You personally, how do you act on that with your kids so that your son's ready to get up the next day for football practice or track and field and not say, yeah, my arm's a little sore, Dad, I don't think I should go today. Right. Uh, well, I always talk about the parents are the parents and the kids are the kids for a reason. I'm not going to let my 17-year-old or 13-year-old child dictate what goes on in our house. Um, you can call that military-esque, but um, no, you set guidelines, and, and this is the way I explain it to families. So, if Ben, if I put a 10-pound dumbbell in your hand and I had you do bicep curls you know, for an hour, the bicep's going to be sore. So, our electronics, and I know at school we're on tablets, we're on laptops, uh, we're on smartphones, we're on televisions, we're around electronics quite a bit. So that is constant exercise for our toolbox, what I call our toolbox in between our ears. So if we're constantly exercising that brain and focusing, and it's gonna get tired. And then when I do experience maybe a little, a, a bell ring or a concussion, it may be a bigger impact because it's tired. So that's how I explain the analogy, is like you're, you're exercising your brain all the time. You're not giving it a chance to rest and recover, like I put that dumbbell down and I can, you know, I do another set of 10, but I'm not doing it for constant, constant hours on end, which sometimes, even as adults, we can get caught up in electronics. So setting guidelines and making sure that at a certain time, depending on the age of your child, that the electronics get put away and they get put on the charging station. More importantly, to let this thing rest and recover, just like I let this rest and recover before the next day. And I mean, we'd ideally, in a situation with kids, like kids to have a really good diet and eat healthily. You know, ideally, you, you'd be, have, be well set up like they are at the University of Michigan or a pit where the athletes have exposure to dietitians. Sure. But just again, you know, I know you're not a registered dietitian, but you are a parent of athletes. Right. What are some general recommendations for parents who maybe haven't worked with an athlete before because their kids are just starting out or suddenly they found their child has had that growth spurt or rather than being the person at the end of the bench, they're one of the starters, they're getting more practice time, they're getting more playing time and nutrition becomes even more important both with the food and with the fluids. Sure, you know, you hit the nail on the head. As a, as a practitioner in health and wellness, as a physical therapist or athletic trainer, strength coach, we know a lot about it. Now, none of us pretend to be registered dietitians. I was very fortunate. I learned from one of the best, Leslie Bonsi, who was with Pitt, who was with the Steelers, who's now with the Kansas City Chiefs. She worked with Gatorade and Usain Bolt. I had the privilege of working with her when I was with the Pirates. So she, she is my education. She's my go-to. Uh, we keep it super simple. Number one, we're eating. You know, we do not depend on five-hour energy, energy drinks, pre-workout drinks. The, thing, the, the products that are sold and really catered to our youth um, we, we teach that food is our energy, and we keep it super simple. Again, we eat breakfast, we eat frequently, and then we pay attention to what we put in our body. A lot of the, this is my 12th year out of pro sports, into the high school, middle school, the general population industry, and most people don't eat enough, believe it or not, especially our young athletes. Uh, they just don't think about it, and it's something that we're always educating, breakfast, early and often, and then the 80-20 rule, we call it. Same with hydration. That's more important than our food. We need to drink and eat early and often. Water's number one, but water can't be everything. There's a place for sports drinks. There's a place for fruit juices and caffeinated beverages, but nothing replaces water. But between the two of them, food and drink, just like we score runs early and often. I know one of the things that uh, I used to work with some youth swimmers when I lived in Florida, and the hardest thing the coach had was a lot of the youth swim meets start at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and the kids would get up to travel to the swim meets, and they'd get up literally 20 minutes before they had to be at the pool, and he had to teach the parents and train the parents, not the kids, that, hey, breakfast is important, even if it's a bagel and peanut butter, or in some cases, that might be appropriate times for an energy bar just to have some Somewhere. calories before you start swimming, or you have that hour and a half practice or two hour practice. That's gas in the tank, Ben. And the body is a super smart machine. If we do not feed our body, our body will feed itself. And unfortunately, it doesn't go after fat, it goes after muscle, and that's not a good thing for our athletes. So making sure we're eating is important. I know as a former, or not as a former, you're always a baseball guy, but you're familiar with Dr. Jim Andrews, the famous sure. orthopedic surgeon. 
And I don't know how many years ago he came out with a recommendation of a pitch number for Little League uh, pitchers based on his experience working with biomechan biomechanists about how many pitches can a child safely throw before mm -hmm. they're set up so you've got an 11-year-old who's had a Tommy John surgery. Unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, most baseball leagues don't follow that. So as somebody who works in the profession and sees people, unfortunately, after they're getting hurt or they've had surgery and maybe they're coming to AHN for rehabilitation or one of the surgeons has done the surgery, what are some red flags in general that parents can look for, whether their kids are younger or they're playing at the high school sport, where it's like, okay, this is a coach or this is something that's a potentially dangerous situation for my kid. Not that they get bumped and bruised, but maybe permanently have problems or it reduces their ability to play the sport or activity. For a pitching standpoint? Just a, from what you see, not, not just a pitching standpoint, but just general red flags that parents might look at and say, okay, maybe we need to talk to the coach or maybe we need to figure out how we can get our child to play with a different coach because they're doing things that are dangerous. Sure. Again, getting back to knowing your child and looking for red flags, um, fatigue, constant fatigue, or that, that bump or bruise that doesn't go away, um, or they start to isolate themselves. Um, you just look for different things that almost, if you Google burnout, it'll list 10 things that you want to look for. Um, weight loss is also one of them. Their stress, their stress levels goes up, which we hate to see in our young athletes. Um, but yeah, that's, those are the things. And, and, and you want to be present. You want to pay attention to what, not that I, we, we call them helicopter parents that are always hovering around and, and really bugging the coaches, but know what's going on especially with those kids because they're not always, even I think the, the generation in general aren't very big on words. Uh, how was practice today? Good. <laughs> and that's all you get. So you need to investigate a little bit as a parent and make sure you know, you're, you know uh, the volume. Volume is big, um, that there is time for rest and recovery in between practices, games, outings, and uh, watching your kid and knowing, you know, just looking for any big changes in character or persona. I know one of the things that you and I have talked about before is sports specialization. Mm -hmm. And I think you're in a unique place because not only are you working in the field, but you have a, a son who plays, at least from what I see on social media, at least two sports or activities. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about sports specialization, the good things about it, the bad things about sure. it, and maybe what's too young for you to say to your son or daughter when the coach says, hey, you're really good, you need to start playing this particular sport year round and give up another sport. Well, I'm a big believer in multi-sports. Um, one, for the development, the rounding out the development of that young athlete. And number two is for rest. Uh, it, it's built-in rest. You know, again, I'll always go back to my experience. And then you can go back and follow with the research. But, you know, fall, it was a fall sport. Mine was football. Winter, mine was basketball. And then spring, summer, it was baseball. And when baseball summer ended, I was put the ball and bat down, and I went back to football. Now with many sports, you can play year-round. Um, more is better. Uh, specialization, you know, we still preach the multi-sport athlete. I think families feel like they're falling behind if they're not continuing to get those reps in with the travel organization or practicing while they're also playing another sport because they are doing the multi-sport, but they're also keeping that one sport going all year. Um, you just want to make sure it's not too much. Again, the volume for the kid. And then understand, they have homework and they have to be a fifth grader or a sixth grader and have a social life. It, it needs to be a balance. Um, is there a magic age? You know, I'm all about repetitions and practice, uh, but there needs to be a time where we're changing up the game or changing lanes um, for the reasons I said, to w make my ball player a well-rounded athlete because maybe soccer gives them some things that baseball doesn't when it comes to footwork. And also gives his arm, when we're talking about a baseball or softball player, gives his arm a break or her arm a break. Um, early specialization leads to really good young athletes, but the downside of it is it, it could lead to overuse injuries um, and it could lead to early burnout. Overuse injuries when it lead to doctor visits and surgeons, and that's really the biggest reason, other than the quality of family life, why I stayed out of professional sports. It really breaks my heart to see a 12, 13, 14 year old going to see one of our AHN orthopedic surgeons to have a surgery. Uh, and then they come to us for physical therapy and we're trying to put like Humpty Dumpty back together again. So I'm not a fan. It, it's, it's something that us as parents need to protect 
our children. And, and God bless coaches and voluntary coaches at the youth level. Um, but I think there's a lot of emphasis on winning at too young of an age. Um, I think winning is part of development. None of us like to lose, but at the expense of uh, a young lad's arm or, or too much volume on their knees from playing soccer and running cross country in the same season, that's tough. That's tough and their bodies just aren't, they're not equipped to handle the volume. It sounds like you had a similar experience growing up to what I did. I, I was soccer in the fall and I grew up on a dairy farm and my dad's comment was you can play one sport and then halfway through the soccer season he said, hey, you know, you should probably support the school and play basketball. Halfway through the basketball season, hey, you should probably play baseball. So I was fortunate it was a small school district so you didn't have to be very good so I could participate. Right. But it enabled me to develop a wide variety of, of interests. I'm curious uh, with you individually with your son because I know he plays football and he's a track and field athlete. Right. Was that something you, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, that you pushed on him or he just kind of gravitated, hey, I want to do these two activities? Or did he play more sports and kind of has narrowed it down to, air quotes, specializing in these two? Sure. Well, I have two, two sons and you know the, the football player and the track and field athlete. And then my little one's a seventh grader, um, and he's uh, an endurance animal. So he's on the trails, like much like you, <laughs> you and Lisa. You guys are on the trails and the bikes, and he's he's in the cross country for the first time. Mm -hmm. But we threw it all at him. They played soccer. They played little penguins hockey, and and um, you know flag football, and of course baseball, and and they played in our in Wexford. It's NABA, North Allegheny Basketball Association, basketball. Mm -hmm. So they try it all and you kind of throw it all up there and see what sticks and see where their passions lie. And, um, you know, then you start to get a little more focus on where they want to spend their time and efforts and then mom and dad's resources. And I'm curious with both of them when they switch, would not switch, but the one with the two sports in high school and the yep. one with cross country, is that something that you and your wife said, hey, you know, this is the sort of thing you might want to try these sports, or is this something that they just said, hey, mom, dad, I want to do these? It was them, man. We lived our lives, <laughs> you know. It, it's, it, it's all them. I know what's interesting with so many youth sports is they have the high school sport, and then literally depending on, no matter what the sport is, there's a travel team sport, mm -hmm. and then they'll have their individual coaches for the sport. I know a, a good friend of mine kind of, said to me, he said, you know, a little part of me died. My son's playing travel lacrosse because that's the only lacrosse that's in the area. What's your attitude or what's your thoughts as a professional when somebody who has a pretty good youth athlete comes to you and they talk to you as a professional because they see what you do and say, you know, what about travel team? We'll just throw out travel team basketball since we've been talking about baseball for my son in addition to the basketball season and the summer sport he plays. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? On travel altogether? Travel altogether. Well, again, that used to be called uh, Select or AAU. Now it's called Travel. It's all the same. Um, it's in there. It's it's part of mainstream society now. Um, it is a source of income for certain people. That's how they run it as a business, and I think um, it's it's just part of what we do. So for that parent. I, I try to direct them towards some reputable organizations. There are some organizations that do it better, where the, the focus is on development and not so much winning the trophy, the ring, or the medal um, at the expense of a child's health. Uh, so there are those organizations that are out there in the baseball and the volleyball, and, and they have ex-college coaches or ex-college players, ex-professional players and college coaches running these organizations. So in my, those are the organizations that I try to align myself with to direct parents to if, if they are going down that road of travel, you know, travel sports. And it sounds like if a parent is thinking about the long-term health of their child, using something like uh, AHN for a physical or even evaluation, mm -hmm. hey, my son or daughter runs a little bit weird, I wanna figure this out, that's the time to pick, a th pick the brain of the professional, whether it's you or one of the people who works under you saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking about letting them try out for travel team whatever or AAU whatever. Um, can you offer some recommendations of things I should work, look out for? Or maybe even what are, the, what are the organizations you like so that way you're not bad-mouthing them when people say, well, Frank just talks negative about us. No, um, that's a great question because, like I said, Ben, travel's not going away. Uh, so how do we better equip families with their children to withstand, again, the volume that's out there facing them? And, you know, we encourage, we encourage our young families to 
let let Johnny or Susie play what they're going to play, but we need to incorporate some level of strength training, uh, an eye on wellness, an eye on recovery as part of this pie. It can't just be play, 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 break. So it's the education of the families, whether, you know, again, hopefully they find us pre, uh, pre-injury or they end up finding us post-injury, but it's educating them on the importance of rest and recovery, nutrition, hydration, and rest, and then, of course, some level of strength training plan that they can do at the house with minimal equipment with those younger ages or, you know, in facilities like AHN Sports Performance and Physical Therapy, you know, your YMCAs, your LA Fitness, where we can give them some direction on good strength training programs to do to facilitate keeping them healthy and, you know, helping them continue their development. Somebody comes to you and says, you know, Frank, my son's just made the varsity team in high school or my daughter's going to be the number two cross country runner at uh, whatever the high school is. What are three pieces of information you can give, give me so that I can help them be most successful, not only with their sports career, but so when they finish high school, if they go on to college to participate in that sport or if they don't, they enjoy that sport because I know and you probably know there's so many kids or college athletes who finish their sport and they throw down the ball on the bat or they throw away the swimming pool right. and never again are they going to do that. Well, we love to, we consider it, we call it tools for life. So what we're doing in our facilities, Ben, they're going to continue to do when they go on to college or become adults and eventually parents. Um, so these are tools that they're going to continue the rest of their lives. And if they're that high school varsity age and they live in the vicinity of one of our facilities and have the resources, I would really highly encourage them to seek out our services and to come sit for an evaluation. And if they're fortunate enough to be able to train with us, great. If not, let us write you a program based off that evaluation and the sports you play and your goals. Some people don't want to play in college. Maybe varsity is it at the end, or some do. Um, we can help you with your programming at that high school level and beyond. I really love the idea, and so many people don't realize it, that you don't have to work with a trainer or you don't have to work in a facility all the time most well-designed facilities are willing to see you for a few sessions, give you a training program, and then have you come back, whether it's once a month or once every three or four months. I mean, I know I tell all my older clients that I work with, it's like, you don't need to see me all the time. I'll give you a program, but do something. Right, and if anything good has come out of this pandemic, it's the use of remote and Zoom and Microsoft Teams, where we can work with, you know, we can work with clients all over the country. And there's no more the excuse, well, we don't want to spend 25 minutes in traffic driving to right. AHN or driving to the YMCA because yep. a smart coach, a smart, a smart uh, athletic trainer is going to say, hey, I can do this. I think one of the interesting things is the development of telemedicine, which was allowed for a while in Pennsylvania. And I, w- I know I was able to see an athletic training chiropractor for a, a back problem, and he was able to say, hey, you've done this before. I've seen you do this before. These are the exercises so that we're successful. And even as a professional, I was to have somebody who took the emotion out of it, I, was, I would say, oh, you're right. This is going to be okay. Yeah. I've had the good fortune to talk with Frank Velasquez. Frank is with Allegheny Health Network Sports Medicine and Performance. That's a mouthful. Website's pretty good, and I think one of the things, if you don't want to train at one of these facilities, pick a professional either at AHN or someplace else and get your son or daughter checked out so that you can identify problems before they occur rather than after they occur. Frank, always a pleasure to talk to you, and thanks for coming to the South Hills to talk to Movement as a Lifestyle. Ben, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mm